Um, my name is Arthur Reiser. I'm the host of this event. Um, um, I work for the Artistry Institute, which is a small libertarian think tank here in D.C. And uh, we're here today to talk about pretrial reform. And I'm not going to take too much of your time um, before I sit down. But I, I want to thank everybody for coming today and participating and listening. Uh, we have a fantastic panel. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, which is Professor uh, uh, Mark Howard from Georgetown uh, University. He is a professor of law and government, and he is going to be our esteemed uh, moderator today and lead us through this uh, fascinating and important topic of uh, bail, uh, pretrial, and jail reform. Okay, thanks, Arthur. Uh, it's good to be here. Thank you all for coming. Um, as Arthur said, so I teach at Georgetown uh, Government and Law. I also direct the Prisons and Justice Initiative which is something we started about a year and a half ago. Uh, we have a lot of programs within prisons in addition to academic events and, and activities uh, on the Georgetown campus. Um, so what I also do in my spare time, and this will be relevant in a minute, is that I've been a volunteer professor in a prison in Maryland for the last three years going in every week and come back to that. But uh, we have a great uh, panel for today, a fantastic set of speakers. Um, we're going to discuss the Key Trial Integrity and Safety Act of 2017, which was introduced by Senators Kamala Harris and Rand Paul. Um, I think everyone here can agree, and everyone who really thinks carefully about this issue can agree that the current system of pretrial detention and bail is flawed and is, is, is deeply unfair. We have, uh, you know, there are a lot of numbers that get thrown around in conversations about mass incarceration. We always talk about 2.3 million people who are locked up today. Of them, 1.6 million in prison, 700,000 in jail. The conversation tends to focus on the prison part, right? But we have 700,000 people at any given time who are in jail. 12 million who are 12 million admissions in any given year, right? But of the 700,000 people who are currently in jail today, 450,000 of them, which is to say two thirds, are awaiting trial, right? Which means that they're legally innocent, and most of them could be released if they could afford bail but bail is often set an amount that they can't afford to pay. And so the consequences of that are, not only can they not have their liberty, but they often lose their jobs, perhaps lose their housing, in some cases lose their families, all while being still legally innocent, all while having a right to leave, could they afford bail, right? So it's a system that is uh, deeply flawed and very, very unfair in terms of its application. And I think that um, it's hard to, to deny that. Of course, the most extreme example of this was Khalif Browder, that many people know the case of New York in Rikers Island, right, where a young boy at age 16, and they're spending three years in jail awaiting trial with a bail set at $3,000 that his family couldn't afford for stealing a backpack, which he didn't actually do, denied doing, and turned down something like 19 different plea deals, and finally the charges were dropped, and later he committed suicide as a result of all the damage he suffered from while he was in jail awaiting trial. Um, I think what's important about the Pretrial Integrity and Safety Act is that it's bipartisan, right, which is rare these days. Um, it's relatively inexpensive. Arthur and others will get into some of the details. It authorizes $10 million uh, in grants over three years to states, and it's something that, if applied properly, should save much more than that in terms of future incarceration costs. And it proposes a practical method for deciding who is safe to be released and who should remain in jail awaiting trial. And I think we could all agree that there are certainly instances of people who should stay in jail while they're awaiting trial for violent crimes who could perhaps be committing other violent crimes. Uh, so there's public safety and also fairness that are at play um, with this bill. So we have four panelists who have a great deal of knowledge um, and experience with this issue. Um, they come at it from different perspectives and indeed different life experiences. Start, we'll start with Arthur Reiser, right? He's the Director of Justice and National <coughs> Security Policy at the R Street Institute and the one who's helped to put together um, this panel. He's also a former police officer and prosecutor. Then we'll turn to Ed Chung, who's the Vice President at the Center for American Progress, focusing on criminal justice reform, and also himself a former prosecutor. And I can, I think, give away that Arthur tends to come more from the right and Ed to come more from the left, so we have some um, bipartisanship uh, here in there. Uh, backgrounds. Um, and then also we have, uh, I'm going to turn to, uh, at the end, Robert Green, who is the director of the Department of Correction and Rehabilitation in Montgomery County in Maryland, um, who's very, very involved in, in searching for new and workable solutions 
um, from the perspective of uh, prison administration and corrections. And then finally, and this ties back to what I said in the introduction that I was going to get to, um, my own experience teaching in a prison, it gives me tremendous personal satisfaction and pride to be able to introduce Saquon Merritt to you here, um, who was my student uh, when he was incarcerated, and who actually was released on October 13th of this year. Initially, he had a 25-year sentence for possession with intention to distribute 2.4 grams, grams, not kilograms, grams of heroin. And thanks to some changes in drug sentencing policy and his own uh, good legal work, which I think was helped by the education that he acquired while he was in prison that I hope I played some small role in uh, granting him. Um, he has been released, and I think he's emerging as a leading voice in criminal justice reform. So I'm really thrilled that he could join this panel today. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it to Arthur, and then we'll go uh, in order with Sukhan going last. Welcome. Yeah, so uh, my <coughs> initial comments are going to be kind of painting a broad picture of uh, how I see the landscape of pretrial reform. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll comment on the specific <coughs> bill, uh, but Ed really is, I would consider, the, the premier subject matter expert in uh, the, the history of the bill, the progression of the bill, and the future of the bill. So I'll let him uh, dig into that. Uh, I, I look at pretrial from a, con I'm an unabashed conservative. I, uh, I am a recovery Republican, but I am an unabashed conservative um, and libertarian. And I, I, I look at pretrial as being, um, in, in my uh, personal view, is one of the most important issues for my movement. And I'll tell you that because the words you are under arrest um, are the most powerful things the government can say to you. And with those words, you are under arrest, they can take you, um, they, can, they can hurt you, uh, and they can put you into a facility uh, where, you know, depending on what day of the week you get, you know, arrested, you could sit um, for days without even talking to a lawyer or a judge. And so it's important, as a, in my opinion, a bedrock principle of conservatism and libertarianism is a limited government, a government that can act, cannot act arbitrary and capricious against its own people. And so by, by fighting um, the government's power of you are under arrest and ensuring the government is uh, maintained to the highest standard, um, that is a, a conservative principle, in my opinion. And it's something that I, 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 I fight dearly for. Um, also, just the idea of justice and fairness. Um, I, I find it uh, you know, laughable that so many of my conservative friends, you know, they, they stand on this bedrock of like, Christianity, but forget that Jesus was in pretrial detention um, and had a pretty rough time in pretrial detention, I might add. Uh, um, and I don't think he, he, you know, he didn't have a bail schedule. So uh, you know, it's a good example of why you need a good lawyer, right? Um, I, I think that the idea of fairness and, and, and a, a system that is equitable is important, and there is no disputing that the way that we handle pretrial in the United States is not fair. It is not equitable. Um, you have an a, a young lady who steals a cell phone in New Orleans. Um, she shouldn't have stolen a cell phone. She should be punished for stealing a cell phone, but she was in high school. She ended up not graduating high school because she was put in detention for 30 days for a, because she couldn't pay a $250 fee for uh, stealing a cell phone. But then you have somebody like um, Ebenezer Nob, which I admit is a great Disney villain name, um, who was you know, picked up in uh, Texas, Dallas County, I believe. And because he could afford bail, even though he was arrested for a violent crime, and there was every indication that he was an incredibly violent person, he posted bail, and then he went out and killed a man like within days of uh, posting bail. And so this system that we have is not fair. And then lastly, it's just expensive. By the time this panel is over, the state of Texas will spend $75,000 just in the 90 minutes that we're going to talk here today, $75,000 on low-risk individuals. Now, I can debate with you what a low-risk individual is, but in general, generally speaking, a low-risk individual is somebody who doesn't have a long history of crime, doesn't have violent crimes on the record, and uh, most importantly, uh, hasn't had a history of absconding from uh, showing up to court. So for low-risk individuals, the state of Texas spends $75,000 in 90 minutes. It's, uh, what is it? It's 991 minutes, uh, $991 a minute. Um, and that's Texas, and they're cheap. They're efficient in locking people up. And California, they spend $3 million a day. They spend more money in California on hosting, uh, hosting, on detaining <laughs> low-risk individuals. It's very important when I say low-risk. 
low risk individuals than they do on the UC system, than they spend on their universities. That is outrageous. And from a conservative principle uh, of, of saving money, and, and if you look at pretrial as a failing big government, uh, I stole this idea from George Will, as, as, as failing big government, we need to do something about it today. So, I want to thank first Arthur for uh, inviting me. This is the second time that I've been at an event with Arthur, and number one, they always have great food, so unfortunately, it doesn't look like I'll taste any today. Um, and then secondly, I always want to uh, kind of uh, joke with Arthur, but it's not really a joke, that even though we come from different sides of the political spectrum, uh, Arthur on these issues, very progressive, even sometimes more progressive than I am. So uh, let's, let's make sure that everybody <laughs> knows use that, the P -word. that Arthur is progressive, <laughs> period. We have parentheses on criminal just justice issues. That out. <laughs> Arthur Reiser is progressive. <laughs> um, I come from two, uh, two uh, backgrounds I want to kind of uh, share with you. One is as a former prosecutor. Um, I, I started my career as a, a ADA, assistant district attorney at the Manhattan DA's office. I prosecuted drug crimes there. Um, and then I also worked in the Obama administration, the Office of Justice Programs, where we, uh, where it's a grant-making component. It has a budget of four billion dollars. Two billion of that is, um, I should say, discretionary grants. Um, but it's grants that go out to state and locals. The other two billion, crime victims fund. And so, one of the things that I want to focus on here is the bill itself. And then the other thing is just the question of, as a local prosecutor, how does bail work, and what, how does it affect the court process? Um, on, the, on the bill itself, I just want everybody to know that uh, the way that Senator Harris crafted the bill along with uh, Senator Paul, it does a few things that I think should be, uh, it, it holds to several principles that I think uh, are across the board wide to do when it comes to criminal justice reform. And first, I think across the ideological spectrum, we want to rely on more data and evidence. Um, we don't want to rely solely on data and evidence but we want to rely on more data and evidence. And let me give you an example of how things worked you know, 10, 15 years ago when I was a line prosecutor. So the, a case, a drug case, would come into ECAB, Early Complaint Assessment Bureau, right? And so everybody would staff that for a period of time. And you write up the complaint at that point. You talk with detectives, you talk with police officers, and you write up a complaint. But at the bottom of that sheet, there would be a, time, there would be a place for what your bail recommendation would be and arraignment would be in 24 hours. So when you're making your bail recommendation when the case is coming in, you only, as, as a prosecutor, you only have two data points that you can rely on. One, what is the person being charged with? And that's, you're relying on the police officer, you're relying on the facts, you're relying on your knowledge of the situation. And then the second thing is rap sheet. And those are the only two data points. And in the rap sheet, you have age and address. If it's known, you have criminal history. But you don't know anything else about the person. And so 24 hours later, the person uh, it appears in front of an arraignment judge, uh, or an initial appearance judge, and they set bail at that point. If it's a felony charge, then you have five or six days later, then you get arraigned in felony court. But that initial determination of what the bail is is initially done with very little data and evidence. And so the movement these days to put more evidence in front of decision makers is a good one. Again, though, we shouldn't rely solely on data and evidence. We should rely more on data and evidence. And so this bill, that uh, the, the Harris and Paul bill, the Pretrial Safety and, Just Safety and Integrity Act, uh, really pushes that evidence-informed, data-informed perspective uh, into criminal justice policy. The second, as somebody coming from uh, the Office of Justice programs that, uh, again, if this bill becomes law, when this bill becomes law, let's be, let's be uh, hopeful here, uh, when this bill becomes law, uh, it'll be administered through the Office of Justice programs. Uh, it's an incentive bill. So pre-trial, from my uh, I guess, from my view from CAP, it really in the last two or three years has taken off as an issue. Uh, and it takes some time for, to convince the public to do that. And I think we should do that as quickly as possible and as efficiently as possible 
But one of the ways to do that is to incentivize states by helping them with resources and technical assistance uh, to uh, know what the latest trends are, to know what the latest success stories are in, in states like New Jersey or Kentucky or other places, and California is, is doing this as well. There's a decision in Harris County in Texas and so forth. So there's a lot of places that are working to uh, reform their bail systems or pretrial systems. Uh, Montgomery County, I, I will not uh, I'll me definitely mention uh, Maryland. Um, and so reform their pretrial systems and so people can learn from each other. So the way the bill is crafted, the other options of penalizing federal uh, uh, grants or to put conditions on particular grants our options, I think, for this uh, particular bill, or uh, for this particular issue, incentivizing is a very wise way to go. And the third thing is, is that we're looking at a significant amount of money for a limited number of states. Now, obviously, it would be, I think, in my opinion, it'd be better to get more states involved and more money out there, but instead of having just a, a small amount of money incentivized to a larger pool. We're talking about trying to make bigger change in a smaller number of states so that those reforms can continue. So those are all the things that are in here along with best practices um, that are uh, shown by evidence. One thing that you should look at in this, uh, in this bill is the findings part. Because I don't want to go through all the statistics, uh, but the findings does a really good job of summarizing, for especially for all of you here who are uh, staffers, all of the kind of uh, an executive summary of the reasons why this issue is important. Um, so I'm going to put on my other hat uh, uh, of a form as a former prosecutor, and you know, on a day-to-day -day basis of how cases go through the system. And I'll just take my example from uh, from New York State. I was a federal prosecutor after that, but from New York State, one of the questions that we, people get when you're talking about bail reform and pretrial reform is. You know, we talk about Khalif Browder, and Khalif Browder was in jail for months, years, for stealing a backpack, or allegedly stealing a backpack. How is a person who is allegedly stealing a backpack in jail for years? And this is how one of, and I don't know the case itself in terms of like what the process was, but let me just give you an example of some of the ways that cases go through a criminal justice system. So after the bail, after bail is set, and let's say bail is set at a, at a $15,000 or $20,000, regardless of if you think that's reasonable or unreasonable, if you can't pay that or if you can't pay the 10% fee that usually comes with it from the, from a, uh, for a bail bondsman, then they remain in jail. And if it's a felony case, in New York State, you have six months it's a it's a CPL criminal procedure law 3030. You have six months uh, in order for that case to proceed to trial, and I'll, in many situations there are ways that the, that 3030 clock can be waived. That speedy trial clock can be waived. Multiple reasons: uh, witnesses are unavailable. Usually, first by the way, the judge grants an automatic one-time you know uh, extension, and that that time is waived off, so it doesn't count towards your speedy trial clock. Then you can have, if the defense attorney is not ready, the defense attorney can ask for a continuance. And that if the defense attorney asks for it, that time is waived. And it goes further and further and further. So even if you're trying to get to uh, a speedy trial within six months, or other jurisdictions may have less than that, that clock can be extended for a long time. And it can be extended beyond the time that somebody can, the minimum sense or the likely sentence that somebody can receive once they're in jail. So Khalif Browder being in jail for a long period of time for a relatively minor crime, even if the Khalif was accused of committing a felony, the time that, he, I'm not saying it's a typical amount of time that somebody's in jail that long awaiting trial, but it's not something that, you know, prosecutors in the system would say, oh, okay, I, I can't see how that could ever happen. So the combination of these issues, and I, again, this is not to blame prosecutors because I've asked for continuances, defense attorneys have asked for continuances and so forth. This is, some of it is built into how many cases go through the system, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, the effect on the person, and something I had didn't realize when I was a prosecutor, 
Uh, the effect on the person can be extreme and can be, uh, especially for somebody who didn't commit the crime, or especially for somebody who's charged with a higher level crime and eventually will either plead down or the actual appropriate crime for which they, uh, they are, they should be convicted of, is less than uh, the time that they actually serve in jail. So those interactions and interplays are really crucial in, in, to keep in mind when we're talking about pretrial. It's not simply the, the top line talking points of, you let somebody out, they're gonna commit a crime, that's it. There, there's more to the process of criminal procedure and criminal justice uh, that goes into all of these, uh, uh, all of these decisions. Good afternoon. I'm Robert Green. I'm the Director of Corrections in Montgomery County, Maryland. I, I will give you my perspective as an individual that has been doing this for 33 years in the correctional system. I did not start as a director. Or, I started as a correctional officer, handing out soap and toilet paper in 1985, and had a desire to understand how the system could work and how the system could work better. And pretrial supervision, quite frankly, is the great equalizer in my mind, of our criminal justice system. Today, in Montgomery County, I'm supervising 777 people in the community. I'm supervising 723 inside the secure confines of three facilities. We have more people in the community that we're supervising. That doesn't include other alternatives to incarceration programs, which actually takes that number up to about 1,695 individuals in the community. Pretrial supervision is must be uh, an element of every piece of a justice reinvestment strategy. 30 states, 33 states in the United States have a Justice Reinvestment Act, a Justice Reinvestment Strategy. I can't tell you how many uh, put uh, uh, pretrial supervision as a significant element of that, but it should be all. When you look at jails, as, as my colleague said, you know, we often look at what we think is the deep end of the pool is the prison population. The deep end of the pool is the number of individuals that are going in and out of local confinement in America's jails. 11 to 12 million individuals in and out the doors, some multiple times. So when you think about pretrial supervision as the great equalizer, what do I mean by that? We're taking money out of the equation, but we're also making sure through using validated risk assessment. Um, and we're taking the time through a human being. We do not use a tool in my county that is a blind tool. We use a tool that involves a human being talking to another human being um, and seeking information from them. And that can sometimes be, be controversial, but, but let me get to where I'm going. Um, uh, the relationship that begins in, in the utilization of that tool makes sure that people that are, are in our jail systems are there because they are a danger to the community, a danger to society, a danger to you and I, not just individuals that we're mad at. Um, and, and, and this uh, you know, pretrial supervision in our county, it's very robust. It's 26 years we've been doing it. It's not a novel idea. Uh, we've had a very progressive county, very progressive group of leaders that saw the wisdom of this 26 years ago. And we talk about the data. So uh, the data is great. The data of 95% you know, public safety rate, individuals that are not reoffending are being rearrested while they're uh, on supervision. Um, uh, we talk about the failure to appear rate, 96% 96, uh, 96 appear in court, 4% don't, and the processes that we utilize. But I think there's a, there's a lot of other things that are happening in pretrial supervision when it begins to become a very sophisticated program. Here's a stat that works for us in our county. If you're on pretrial supervision, you're successfully engaged in one of four levels of supervision, uh, you're about 50% less likely to get any type of sentence at the point of walking into the courtroom or any type of time that's going to involve uh, a, a jail sentence because the, you've already shown and, and we have shown and worked together to show to the courts that we are engaging this process of helping another human being um, I think engage the issues that brought them there. Other things that I find in, in this robust <coughs> system is, is that, you know, we often think of pretrial supervision as a call going from inside to out, reminding you you have a court date coming up, reminding you uh, that you may, if you're on level three supervision, have to come in for a drug test, reminding you of this. What's very intriguing is the number of calls that come the opposite way when there's case management involved and there's services. You think about the amount of money we spend in my county, in this country, in this state, wherever you look on establishing services to individuals, but we sometimes expect that some, some media is going to connect them to that, or here's the website. Um, you know, we don't think about how to get there. 
how to navigate the process, a, a, an individual to call. A lot of nonprofits that are running on a, on a shoestring, ladies and gentlemen, they, they may have to change their phone number and their location four times in a year, three times in a year. How do we actually make connections with individuals and people that want to help themselves, utilizing people to the services that we spent lots of money establishing? So I find it very interesting and unique that the calls that come in, that aren't supervision calls going out, have, can, can you help me navigate child care? Can you tell me where there are clothes at in our community? Or can you tell me, um, um, you know, I just lost a, a benefit, how I can engage other services that immediately, all of us know, can start a downward spiral for any human being. Um, it, it helps us engage all of those services and keep people connected. That's the real human element that I find uh, 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 very intriguing. Uh, we have 14 case managers that, that help manage this in a system that, that I, as I said, is very mature over 26 years. But there's a lot of pieces to pretrial supervision and connectivity that ultimately we're helping individuals engage, I, I think, services that really help them. Um, uh, uh, across a, a multitude of programmatic areas. Um, um, and, and in that realm, we kind of don't know what we don't know. How many of those programs, those opportunities, are really opportunities that, that help change people's lives? Um, I, I could talk about it all day. I'm looking forward to some questions uh, from you. But uh, it has worked for us for 26 years. It has worked very, very well. Um, and, and I believe, um, you know, the data will, will show us that it's the right place to go. It has. And, you know, we're making change. I'm seeing more and more counties that are grabbing on uh, to the idea of community supervision, especially in our state. We've got to see. In the Pretrial Justice Institute's uh, uh, report card that came out today, we've got to see. Um, we wouldn't have gotten to see last year if it wouldn't have been for people like Brian Frosch, our Attorney General, who took some extraordinary measures to begin to start looking at, at this issue and people like Paul DeWolf in our Public Defender's Office and many other wonderful leaders. So I look forward to some questions from you as well. Um, as Mark said, my name is Saquon Merritt. Um, looking at this bill, I'm for this bill. Now, each one of y'all would think, well, I probably would be for this bill being an ex-offender, so yeah, I want to get out, or I want people that I have uh, identified with my past get out. Um, however, um, from my experience, I, my bail was set at $250,000 for two grams a pound, and I had a co-defendant. He got locked up with, it, it was broke down to 2.4 uh, grams, but the pills were 17, they were little capsules. My co-defendant, which was a white co-defendant, he had seven pills. He got released on his own recall, $250,000 bail. And I got sentenced to 25 years without parole. He got 18 months off suspended by probation. And as I sat in a uh, pretrial, um, you know, my family had to scrape together the 3% to make bail. Um, but I've sat in pretrial beforehand and, and nothing happened. I was idle, inert, uh, absolutely nothing. And you have a lot of offenders just sitting there. So we got to start thinking if we care about the community, we care about people reoffending, this bill would allow us to be proactive, especially page 15 when you talk about the data that must be provided by uh, different jails for people being incarcerated, breaking down the demographic with age, uh, race, disability, and uh, things like that. We can start actually gauging on who's getting arrested, what they're getting arrested for, and maybe look at ways on trying to figure out how we can be prevent them getting arrested again. Instead of spending the money, they said the money is a $20 billion a year annual, annually, bail bond industry, $20 billion. At East Coast Bails Bomb, it got a, a beautiful video. And a uh, beautiful video, you know, he's talking about in the community, Baltimore up and down, Fulton Street, one of the most dangerous communities, and he's smiling, giving out his shirts, but he's laughing about people getting incarcerated. He's laughing, about, and I encourage you to get locked up and call me when you do. Instead of looking at ways and preventive measures to stop people from getting arrested, programs, things of that nature. That's how I'm sitting here, uh, you know, with the man upstairs, God, and also an education. If I didn't have that affordability of education at post-conviction, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have been able to uh, give my time back. I wouldn't be able to read books and have access to certain things. So having these different programs at a pretrial point, and making a platform at pretrial, 
opposes spending all these extra dollars. I think it's $37,000 $37, a year for an inmate. And on average, I think we got guys that sit there, what, six, seven months in Maryland? Uh, in, in jails. Can be. <coughs> Baltimore City Jail, you had guys sitting there three years, two years for nonviolent offenses. So then you have 60000 upwards towards $100,000 being wasted in just pretrial. When uh, other funds can be spent on bettering the community, other funds can be spent on getting programs and trying to figure out why this guy doesn't have a job. Because ultimately, criminals break a law because of lack of financial stability. That's what I did. Because I didn't know another way to provide for myself. To I educated myself. I didn't have exposure to that. Exposing these pretrial uh, offenders to that, two different programs, instilling some hope in them would be actually better opposed to just people keeping them incarcerated and as I said again, in ERT, in a pretrial setting. Um, so, uh, long story short, I can pretty much go on for days, but long story short, I, I, I definitely believe in this bill. I'm for this bill. Um, I am, want, to, want to put it out there, I'm not um, for violent, extreme offenders being released. <coughs> I care about my community. I have a 13-year-old son in the community that I had to get early from uh, his school last night because of the Halloween situation growing up in Baltimore City. So I do care about the community and I don't want violent offenders to be uh, expedite their process of being released. But however, uh, for nonviolent offenders that can maybe put even better use to the community, uh, maybe extensive uh, pretrial program that have, upon release engage you on going to a job readiness program, engage you on taking some college courses, or uh, job training, uh, job training programs that actually get you, make you employable, would be better opposed to just uh, warehousing in jails. Uh, that's pretty much it. Great. Okay. Thank you to all four panelists. I think we'll open up for questions in a second, but I'll take my prerogative as chair to ask. Uh, I think two questions that that I think any of the panelists uh, could address if they see fit. Uh, the first, I think the the. The magic in all this is what goes into the data, what goes into the individual assessments, right? If, if it's going to come down to decisions, if we, if we take the financial part out of it, and it's just a safety decision, what is it? And we have to, of course, be careful to avoid quick and easy data-driven solutions like zip codes or things like that, which, of course, we know are often socioeconomic proxies. So what what... And this is, I guess, more for Ed, but I think you know Bob can talk about his experience because you have a model that's been around. That's sort of where perhaps the country will get to. It's been around for 26 years in Montgomery County. Um, but what what are the key elements of, of a fair process and and um, set of criteria to individually assess the safety of people in the community? And the second theme I want to raise and. Ed alluded to this, and I think it's something that needs to be made uh, central to the conversation about pretrial detention and <coughs> bail, is plea bargain. Because so much of the sort of functioning of the jail process and the bail and denial of bail for people who are poor is that it's a pressure to accept a plea bargain. Right? And so what's remarkable about Khalif Browder is not so much that he spent three years in jail waiting trial, it's that he turned down almost 20 different plea bargains that were all for time served, all for you know, just a, a misdemeanor um, record. And he, out of principle, said, no, that's what's remarkable. Because almost anybody would at some point just give in. I want to get out. I want to go home. And so we'd see the situation over and over where the pressure... Um, for a plea bargain is fueled by keeping people in jail. And I don't know if you can really disentangle those two things. So I wonder if there's some thoughts. Um, I'll let each of uh, the I'll panelists start. have a turn, and then we'll open it up for questions. I'll start with the, the plea bargain. I, I definitely see that. I remember when I was in AUSA, I had an individual who got caught on the border of San Isidro, Port of Entry in, in San Diego, with 2,000 pounds of marijuana, um, at least a pound of heroin, and a whole bunch of coke. Um, and the guy on, on Thursday was, I'm innocent, I'm not taking any deal. And then on Monday, he was, okay, I will take a deal. And I asked, because he, I believed him uh, in the sense that he thought that he was innocent. I mean, he, the guy was really in, in, insistent on this. Um, 
And so on Monday, I, I said, you know, he wanted a deal, and I said, well, why? What, what happened? What changed? And he, he was, uh, there was an attempted rape um, on him while he was in jail. He was beaten, um, and he just wanted, he thought that he could take a deal and then be deported back to Mexico, and then it would be all, uh, all be good. Um, and I had my ICE agents look into it, and I think at the end we, we, we didn't, I didn't feel that I had probable cause that he actually knew the drug, he was a truck driver, that the drugs were in the back. Um, I, and I, I, I questioned it, so we actually, um, I think I prosecuted him for legal entry or something like that, and gave him time served and, and, and had him go back. Um, but we let him go, on, and he was looking at a 10-year man mid. Um, and he was so willing to plead, um, knowing and really believing that he was innocent. And that, that scared me. Um, and I think, you know, going, I think something that's interesting that all four of the panelists said uh, is that we use the word safety. Um, and I think that we all agree on that. All four of us, all five of us use the word safety. Um, but our current system doesn't make us safer. And th these are, let me tell you some raw facts. If you spend three to four days in jail and you're a low-risk individual, your 40%, your recidivism rate goes up 40%. After 30 days in jail, your recidivism rate goes up 70%. Why? The reason is, is because you are then disinherited from the American dream. You lose your job. Everybody here, if you miss two days of work, be honest. You probably can go back to work two days later and be like, uh, I missed two days of work. Maybe not. I don't know what your bosses are like. But uh, I, if John you know, missed two days of work, I wouldn't fire him. But when you work at McDonald's, that's not the case. And when you, we, we disinherit these people from the American dream, why are we so surprised when they don't want to participate in it anymore? Um, and 95% and of people in jail are coming back. Um, and the, the last thing that I'll, I'll say is I support this bill as well, and I think conservatives should too, and, and you could tweet that. Um, <laughs> I, I, I do have some reservations. I, I mean, I'm a libertarian, and I always have reservations about federalism. Um, but I do like the fact that it's not a mandate. It's, it's an it incentive. Um, I also am worried what happens when money um, runs out. But I think in this case, if you build it, you know, they will come. Uh, and I, I believe that in the, in the grand picture, um, that this is a fair, modest reform um, that I think actually fair, modest bill that will encourage um, states to reform. And I, what the thing about this bill that's the best thing is it's state-focused. Because that's where all the issues are. It's in the, at the state level. Um, so I really uh, I, uh, I, I give praise to the senators for putting something that is quite it's brave. I mean, in this environment, anything that could be appear to be against law enforcement, um, you're screamed at, and then somebody with a shiny badge convinces our, our president that it's a bad idea. Um, and I, so I, I really give a lot of uh, praise to the senators for putting up this brave bill that it can make people's lives better and can make us safer. I think on, on, on the risk assessment piece, and, and let me start with saying this, you know, when, when you start looking at these elements that, that when you're going through this risk assessment, you know, it, it's not a factor whether you own a house uh, that is, is going to indicate whether or not you're going to uh, 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 be a danger to the community. In, in, our, in, in our county, I think what helped us build this risk assessment was this idea of strong collaboration in the criminal justice system. It's not a jail-based system. You know, we're working with the state's attorney, the public defender. We're working with our judges. We're working with health and human services. And, and you know, in our assessment, we have a strong override. The ability of not only what the individual brings to the table, but what we can offer as a service to help stabilize the individual. Um, homeless is, is not an indicator whether or not you're going to stay in jail. Um, uh, it's an individual that we can provide a service to to help stabilize. So when you start looking at the, the validated risk assessments, our, ours are validated to what we can do in our county, the services that we have, not only what the person brings to the, to the table in terms of past criminal history and, and other indicators, but, but what we can do immediately to help um, stabilize that individual and, again, uh, 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 promote a safe environment in the community, but a safe environment for that individual. And I think a very interesting point, and, and I, I throw these out about elements of, uh, of pretrial supervision is in our system we have the ability to set in a line with the judge at any point an individual's circumstances change to the point where you know, wait a second can I come back up for pretrial consideration because this this issue changed or this element changed or we were a able to help 
um, an individual gain some level of programmatic stability that we believe now can put them in one of our levels of supervision. The ability to do that with a judge, the ability to have that and, and not have to petition the courts to do so, but set in a line to do that, I think are all elements that are, are very important. Um, uh, what I would say is what I absolutely like about this bill is what, what my colleague said. It's not a mandate. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a challenge. It's an opportunity um, uh, to, to demonstrate what can be done. Um, so I don't think I'm going to add anything about the risk assessment stuff. I think that I, very well said. Mm -hmm. Two places that you should go to. Um, is there anybody from PJI here? Uh, yeah. So go to go to them first. Uh, yes. And it's pretrial.org. Am I right? Yep. Yep. At pretrial.org. Yep. www.pretrial.org. And the other place that you can go to is the Lauren John Arnold Foundation, and they have their risk assessments online as well. So you can take a look exactly what risk assessments look like and how, where they are, uh, how they're being uh, utilized in different jurisdictions. Um, you know, Mark, in terms of the uh, the issue about plea deal, um, you know, just to expand on what, what Arthur was saying, it, it's not only about whether or not that particular case should be pled out and the pressure for that, right? It is when a prosecutor looks at a case, they're not only looking at that individual case, they're looking at what cases they can make from that case. And so can you flip a person in order to get more leads to more cases? And that is not, I'm not saying that's good or bad, I'm saying that that's what happens. And so it's not, we're talk, we talk all, all the time about prosecutor stats and saying, you know, we have this many convictions and this many plea deals and so forth. but a well-intentioned criminal justice reform-minded prosecutor can also look for plea deals that when we're talking about getting cooperators and gaining cooperation. Now, it's been very well documented about the uh, unfair pr uh, pr pressure that is placed on people. But one of those pressures, whether it's spoken or unspoken, is the fact that somebody who is remains in jail for the reasons that Arthur was talking about in terms of any kind of abuse that you have in there, or the simple disconnection from your community and from your family puts uh, puts incredible pressure on somebody. And I, I you know, I defer to somebody who has um, experience uh, on that to 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 show you know a, a different perspective or, or, or the same perspective on, uh, but from a different view. Um, but it is it it, are, it is those processes that even if it's not an intentional you know uh, it, a, a, a bad intent. Uh, by the actor in the criminal justice system, that's how other parts of the system work. So um, again, when we're talking about how long somebody can remain in jail, if somebody's innocent or that ultimately should have a should be convicted of a lower crime or should have a, a lower sentence, those are some of the factors that come into play, and we really need to rethink how we how we do those types of um, processes in the system. Um, as far as uh, risk assessment. As it stands now, uh, if you have the money, you can get out. So that really doesn't make any sense. So now it's a trade-off, whereas though, okay, yeah, he's violent, but if he has access to $500,000 or $200,000, he can go. That really doesn't make sense. That's not really being, that's the, that's the monetary fact, or the monetary part of these bail bombers that they bleed off of. Uh, saying that, that's actually one of the uh, slogans that East Coast bail bombing have on their t-shirts, Baltimore Bleeds. And um, <laughs> in the position Baltimore is in now with the violence, I don't think that's a good slogan. But, um, and that's pretty much what they're doing. So for a risk assessment, I, I believe that it needs to be uh, turned up a little bit more and taken away from this uh, monetary uh, system that we're dealing with now and actually get harness in on how this, how this offender is and will he commit this crime or hurt other people again. And if not, we're dealing with these low-level nonviolent offenders, why can't we let them go? Thanks. I think now we'll open it up, and if you can please identify yourself and keep it uh, relatively brief and ask a question, not a, a long statement. Uh, go ahead. Okay. I don't need a microphone. No. My name is Samar Chatterjee, State Foundation. Um, I, I think fi I find the bill interesting, and it's come after a very long time. Uh, a bill, uh, who, uh, why, why, and this is a federal uh, bill, uh, which is giving incentives to states, and the federal prosecutors and the federal government itself 
does in their prosecution, they use two arbitrary things. One is flight risk and uh, uh, danger to community to detain any person with a little bit of foreign origin, uh, uh, even though they are American citizens, to detain them and not give them uh, bail. Uh, so that itself, and uh, the feds themselves, should give themselves an incentive to make a reform. And that is one of my beef um, that, that exists in the federal system and should be changed because federal prosecutors arbitrarily use that. And then the gentleman from, from our street uh, said that, you know, that puts pressure on people to plead. And, uh, and that has been used very, uh, and, and therefore, and then the threat of being raped and violence in the prison, it happens in the federal system, which is, uh, which is also used as a threat to accept a plea. And now that is, uh, that's why, you know, when the State Department uses, I'll finish just a moment, uses this human trafficking, I think the United States government and the state government through their prison system are engaged in human trafficking. And they should be punished. There is a lot to unpack there. Um, I, I don't agree with everything that you said, um, but I think that you're, you, you're on to something. I mean, th listen, the fact that you have ties to a, a, a foreign nation is part of a risk assessment. Any legitimate risk assessment would, would, would include that because you do have uh, the ability to go somewhere else. That's part of a risk assessment. And, and I, I find it troubling, in, in, with all due respect, that we're asking for risk assessments and then we want to pull out pieces of a risk assessment that don't jive with with uh, certain other aspirations. Um, if you are a citizen of another country, that makes you, I'm not saying you're a flight risk, I'm not saying you should be detained, but that goes into a risk assessment. It has to. Um, any legitimate risk assessment would, 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 would do that. Uh, but, sir, I'll, I'll talk to you offline. Um, I'm you, talking of a U.S. citizen with a foreign extraction. I, I, will, I, I think there was a lot there. I'm more than willing to talk to you about it, sir. Yeah, on the back. Hi. Um, <clears throat> So I have a question around like just unpacking this whole question of really the focus of the bill, which is on bail. And I want to go back to Mr. Merrick's comment about his white counterpart not having to pay bail um, and getting a lower sentence. And that whole, that's the disparity of mass incarceration, right? Yeah. And so the question I have is with the data that's being collected, you know, at what point in the bill if it's there or it's not there? I looked through it, I didn't really see it there. Do we begin to look at that this is all about the disparities of, of the criminal justice system, right? The fact that, you know, when you talk about Baltimore, that we see bail bondsmen in Baltimore, we don't see it in Alexandria, Crystal City, the way that we do that, that's a disparity. The fact that the, uh, you know, the inequality that exists with regards to pick up and arrest, sentencing, et cetera. So I'm really curious, like, you know, not to say this is a piecemeal bill, bill I think it's an attempt to sort of improve that system, but how do we get to a point where we actually deal with, you know, what we're hearing here? Because the issue in New York City had a lot to do with disparity because he was a black man. I mean, that was the heart of it. It wasn't, you know, had a lot to do with starting at that point. Do you see this bill as part of the solution, a broader solution? Um, and I would say also to the gentleman from the corrections facility, you know, I'm in telecom policy. One of the things that we deal with is inmate calling services. When people are in jail, pre-trial, they can't call anybody either, right? And so isn't that another support of services that we have to begin to look at because there's a tax on pain of being incarcerated, I guess, and this becomes a way to address the bail part of it but in every part of the system, there's a tax, and there's a tax of being black while you're at it. So I'm just curious, like, you know, how do we look at this bill in the context of the broader reform, and how should we as policymakers be looking at how to promote this as not just a piecemeal, but part of the bigger picture? Um, as I said, ma'am, how you doing? On page uh, 15 actually has, when I was looking over the bill, actually has the data provided under the paragraph. Um, one of them says, include percentage of defenders Defendants detained in jail or in prison who are released from jail or prison prior to case disposition broken down by demographic variables yeah. of age group, mm -hmm. sex, race, ethnicity, disability, charge risk, pros, prior, and release condition. So uh, upon that, you go with that to B, then C goes <coughs> provide average time of release from jail for defendants who are released to pretrial broken down by demographic variables. So that, that's happening with this bill. On uh, on the last on the last page, the saying this data needs to be provided. And when I seen that, I actually lit up. My, one of my notes is on the side is hopefully these numbers will lead to finding a deeper problem that caused defenders uh, offenders to commit crimes. Looking at these numbers, engaging these numbers, you see 
uh, on page five, it says African American men pay 30% higher money bail amounts than white men, and Hispanics pay 19% higher. So I believe these numbers will um, give us kind of that, that guideline, kind of that uh, to go try to get be more proactive in solving a deeper problem, which is why are people committing these crimes. Also, uh, I think this needs to be put, depending on what states you're at, uh, as a guideline to maybe put, make a mandate for uh, state legislation uh, in, in each state. So because as, as he said, uh, the, the, this, is a, this is a federal bill. Most of the problems are on state levels. Like even when uh, f families against mandatory minimums were pushing and Obama administration were pushing for uh, the sentencing reform for mandatory minimum sentences, they did it on the federal level. The state level, it, it didn't happen. I was sentenced to a mandatory minimum sentence. And my family was looking at everything that was going on and like, you're coming home soon. I said, no, you have to petition, petition your local delegates to try to get things passed in our state. That's the only how it's going to affect me because I was a state uh, person incarcerated. Um, so I believe this bill can be used, as I said, as, the, as a guideline to maybe drive in the solution that you, uh, you're talking about. T taking money out of the equation first and foremost is, is again, the, the first part of the equalization, period. Um, and then when you begin to, to validate your assessment and looking at, at what you're doing, you're going to look at that exact data that my colleague has talked about. And, and then what other elements to the assessment do you need to look at to make sure that this is not a, a biased tool in any manner, shape, or form. And I think you bring forward a really interesting point about fees. You know, I'm going to go fees next. You know, we can, we can put people on pretrial, and then when you start putting all of the fees that go with it, well, anger management class is $50, and your next urine test is going to be $30. Well, the, the fees then begin to put people out of, we're putting them right back in the same place that they were, the challenge of having to have money to get help. So these fee-driven systems, we don't charge fees. That's, that's our system. But, you know, we've got to make sure that when we, we're building pre-trial, we're not building on the back of money. It's just we're just calling it something different. And your piece on phones, love to talk to you about it because I got rid of commissions on phones 10 years ago. And, um, and how do you keep families connected and keep people connected where you do more good than you do harm? That's a big piece of it. But... Um, so I just want to highlight something else in the bill. Um, in addition to the annual report that comes at the end, the bill requires that whoever receives this money, the actual risk assessment itself also is locally validated and does not, yes. uh, does not um, result in unwanted disparities based on race. So you have kind of, you're required to do that on the front end, and then the report requires you on the back end to make sure that, that, is not, that those disparities are not there. So I fully agree with you about the disparities. I think you know, mm -hmm. we're in line with that. One of the other things, your, your general question about where this is within the larger criminal justice system. And from uh, my perch at CAP, one of the things that we're focusing on, I know Arthur's focusing on this as well, is that it's great in terms of reentry. I think reentry, corrections reform is terrific. I think we need to do more. I think you need to have fewer restrictions on the type of, the, 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 uh, the prisoners who are, uh, who, where programming is accessible, right, to them. Um, I, I, I never understood why somebody who was committed, who uh, has, uh, was convicted of a violent crime, should also not get programming uh, to the same extent while they're incarcerated. But before we get to that point, if we're going to have true criminal justice reform and reduce mass incarceration, you need to turn off the spigot off the, at the front end. Mm -hmm. And part of this is reducing the number of people that are in jail. So we're, you know, from my perspective, and this is not to be attributed to the rest of the table, we're talking about policing reform and we're talking about jail reform. Mm -hmm. And as, when you make progress on that, the trickle-down effect, using a conservative term, the trickle-down <laughs> effect uh, for the rest of the system will, in my opinion, will happen. So I think th this is an incredibly important, it may look like a, one piece of it, but the effect of it through the rest of the system, I think, has uh, tremendous potential. Let me add one thing before I take the next question, because I thought it was a fabulous statement and question. Um, in my mind, and I look at the grand sweep of criminal justice and prisons, right, so not just the, the pretrial part of it, um, there's so much that needs to be reformed. So I just wrote a book, Unusually Cruel, Prisons, Punishment, and the Real American Exceptionalism. I wrote an op-ed in the summer in the New York Times that was focusing on the parole piece. At every single stage of what I call the criminal justice life cycle, there are huge racial disparities, inequalities, injustice. 
right? At every single stage, there are disparities in how people are treated, right? And it's typically, if you look at it comparatively, the U.S. is off the charts, off the rails, compared to other advanced democracies. That being said, and people ask me sometimes, you know, what is the solution? There is no one solution. We will never see a grand sweeping proposal. We have to get at it piecemeal. I wish we could. I would like to propose one, but it's a complete non-starter. And I think this piece is an important one, and I think this is the right way to go. And I hope that on the other pieces, we'll also see some progress. But I think it's great to think of it in the big picture as well. May so I thank add, you for that. May I add a comment to yeah. you? Because it's a great question. And, and you know, one thing leads to another, as my colleague said, you know, we, we talk about these programs of, of pretrial supervision. We talk about diversion. How many years did we talk about diversion? Diverting someone once they're already in the system and diverting them programmatically. Now we need to, and, and pretrial will bring you there, deflection. Mm -hmm. So, you know, write that down. Start watching deflection, because if you have programs in communities that can support pretrial supervision, you also have programs that can then support criminal justice, law enforcement, our colleagues on the street doing that work, that they can deflect them to. Because that program's in place, so then it becomes this, this idea, wait wait a second, I've got Johnny, I've, I've, I've got Johnny un, in custody right now, but here, there's a pretrial supervision program that's dealing with homelessness, sobering, restoration, all of those great, great uh, uh, terms that we're looking at. So, and and those, those build around providing services to people in the system. I can deflect, that means not to jail, not to the criminal justice system to begin with, to let's deflect to this program because your programs are supportive of all the issues that come with criminal justice supervision. And, and, and as we build that, man, it, it's, you know, people say draw it. Let me see the organizational chart, it's not. It's a safety net. It's a safety net under people. It's under people that are criminal justice involved, have problems, social issues. It's a safety, a public safety net but then we start talking about deflection, which is a really cool thing. Okay, we have, I think, three, four, so One, four. Two. Yeah. And him, so. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, this question's for uh, Robert. Uh, what was behind the decision making to go from, at least in part, a um, interview-based um, risk assessment rather than just pure objective standards? Yeah, yeah, yeah for us. the questions, Bob? Is it okay if I take the questions, then we all Yes, sir, them? yes, sir, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Thank you. you. Go ahead. Did you oh, me, yeah. yeah. So, um, as part of bail reform, I think um, adequately funding public defense services is really, really important because as public defenders with the high case lows, low pay, you're, it's going to be difficult to get in front of courts to lower bail, to get bail reduction hearings, to get um, requests for community supervision. So I'm just wondering if the bill addresses that and if it does how. Yeah, just while we're talking about taking money out of the equation, and you kind of talked about like, fines and whatnot, but um, we have cases where people are landing in jail for not being able to pay fines. And you have like, a situation like Ferguson where uh, cities are literally raising so much revenue off of that. And I was just wondering, you talk a lot about how expensive it is to incarcerate and the recidivism crisis. How do you reckon, how do these cities that use that kind of system to what essentially amounts to debtors prisons reconcile the cost of um, incarceration with the revenue they're drawing from those fines? Um, how do we get there in the first place and how do we incentivize out of those systems and does this bill at all pave a way to start addressing other problems where money plays such a role in incarceration like these as present situations. Okay, and one last question then we'll do a round. Thanks. Um, so <coughs> I heard from someone in Senator Paul's office that this bill actually reallocates existing funding. Um, does anybody on the panel have, can provide more context about what we're currently funding with that money? What are we incentivizing uh, at the moment? So I'm going to take two, two, two questions, one on the public defender and one on that one. So the way that the bill is structured, this is an authorization bill, right? It's not an approach bill. So what we're looking at is looking at the way that the bill is structured. You, it's 10 million. I believe it's 10 million. It's 10 or 15 yeah, million. 10 I can't remember. It's 10 million. As I mentioned earlier, the Office of Justice Program budget is $2 billion. So it's a very small fraction, fraction of the OJP dollars. And every year, Regardless of authorization bills, you, I mean, you all know better than I do about how the approach process works, but the approach process, there's always this give and take. And so even if the, an authorization bill says you should fund up to this much, the approach, uh, appro uh, appropriations committees set a particular amount. So what this is doing is it's, it's authorizing the appropriations committee and suggesting to the appropriations committee how much should be set aside. Now, in terms of where it comes from and what's gonna be uh, taken away, 
those are decisions that are going to be made by Congress and by, and by the administration through the process. So there's nothing in here that specifically says 10 million to this, and then you know 10 million is taken out of SCAP or whatever it may be. So, uh, and I think it's intentionally giving flexibility to Congress and to the administration in order to do that. Uh, the question about Sixth Amendment right to counsel, I'm sorry, about counsel in general, um, there is a provision in here that talks about um, that at the, this is on page 11, this is sub, uh, well, sorry, I've been out of uh, the legislative branch for a while, so I don't know my subs and subsections, but page 11 on my, my bill, it says, uh, <laughs> ensuring a defendant is uh, provided with counsel at the earlier of as soon, one, as soon as it is feasible after custodial restraint or to the first appearance before committing um, magistrate judge or judicial officer. That doesn't go to your question about whether it's funded, but it gives states flexibility with their however much they're going to be granted to figure that out. So, you know, no matter what, the underfunding of public defenders um, is not going to be addressed by what, you know, and I'm saying this relatively speaking, but, uh, but by, by the amount that is appropriated here or the authorized here. Um, but at the same time, the fact that you have to do this and it's a, it's a mandatory provision, um, if you're going to receive the grant, I think is a very positive step forward. On, on the assessment, I, I think it's, it's faith and trust. Um, you know, look at the number of individuals that we have that uh, are, are, are not bilingual. Having just a form in front of them, the ability to, to I think, get the responses that you, you need, but also inject information into the assessment that if we can help you with this piece, um, or, or to, to uh, and sometimes tease information out, a phone number, a human being uh, having the ability to get up and go to the individual's property and get out the phone numbers that they kept in their uh, uh, in their property, or go get their cell phone. And I just give you examples of all the pieces, um, and, and then us us looking at our numbers to make sure that we don't have a bias in that. And we're going to look at it again. We're we're getting ready to study our our pretrial program uh, uh, through a grant we just got from the governor's office of crime control and prevention. But it's trust in that you know we're, we're trying to find every way we can to help the individual. And, I, I, and, and for us in our county, we have not yet seen a form, a, an assessment that we think gives us the depth that we have now. Anything on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to address yours. And that, that's a whole, there's a whole panel dedicated to that question you asked. Mm -hmm. I think that um, how do you get the money out of it? I, I don't know, man. I mean, I'm not against bail. Um, as a concept. I think that bail is one tool that we could use in the, the apparatus of pretrial. One tool, but it's the default tool for most jurisdictions these days. And I think that we should change it. I also think that uh, I, I want to put human decision making into it, but also be, I'm wary of that because you have judges in Maryland actually, there was a study that looked at judges um, on the Monday after the Ravens lost and bail was set higher and sentences were set higher. That's outrageous. Yeah. It, that is outrageous. And by the way, that study was done with, like, with juveniles and uh, low-risk individuals. That's craziness. Um, that's why some of the work that pretrial does and Arnold has tried to uh, have algorithms that that take all that into play without having proxy. Um, I, you know, this is the last comment. Comment. I, I think that we know the system is not working, and we know there's ways to make it better. Why not try? And I think this bill is. Uh, one step in the right direction. Is it going to fix everything? No. Is it the silver bullet? Absolutely not. But it is, uh, it, is, it is a step in the right direction. And if it doesn't work, then it's going to run out of money and we can go back to the status quo. Um, and I, I, I will end with my shameless plug that everybody who I have your email address for, I'm going to send you a, a white paper that I wrote called The Conservative Case for Jail Reform. And it talks about a lot of the kind of overarching uh, topics um, that I have been talking about, and um, more than anything else, it has solutions um, based on what I got, you know, uh, from from pretrial and from Arnold Foundation, and some things that that Ed and I have been talking about. Um, but there is a way forward here, so why not why not try? Well, on that hopeful note, please join me in thanking the panelists. For the